So, thank you everybody. Um, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club uh, that I'm directing together with Lieke Plucher. Uh, we are really happy now to welcome you at the second day of the uh, Citizens of Evidence event. And first of all, I would like to thank our team, uh, Nada Bakker and Monty Harmony, our project manager, Jonas Franchi, the designer, Giacomo Marin Salta, the press manager. And uh, we are happy, as I say, to welcome at the 17th event of the Disruption Network Club, uh, that is called Citizens of Evidence, uh, Independent Investigation for Change. Uh, this is the third event as part of the Art of Exposing Injustice series. That is the series that we do together in partnership with Transparency International. And what we are doing today is to explore the investigative impact of grassroots communities and citizens to expose injustice, corruption and power asymmetries. Um, we are funded by the Hauptstadt Kultur Fund, the Capital Culture Fund of Berlin, the Riva and David Logan Foundation. We are supported by a grant from the Open Society Initiative for Europe within the Open Society Foundations. Um, we are also funded by the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation and we work in partnership with the Friedrich Heber Stiftung. In particular for a workshop that we will do tomorrow uh, with uh, uh, Manuel Freudenthal and Sex or Zero 35. Um, and also uh, uh, the investigation part of our program today, we are part of Reimagine Europe, co-founded by the Creative Europe program of the Euro European Union. And uh, for this specific part of the workshop, I also want to thank Supermarkt, that is our partner, and uh, Ella Kagel, that is there in the audience. <laughs> thank you, Ella, for this cooperation. Uh, and uh, uh, also I wanted to say that we have still two uh, places available for the workshop that we are going to do tomorrow, uh, in which we will uh, spot uh, airplanes with antennas uh, flying over the sky of Berlin and trying to do some sort of uh, OS investigation altogether. So we will discuss also more about this workshop today, thanks to the talk of Emmanuel later. Just remember that the two places are still available, so if you want, you can join. And uh, now I want to enter into the matter of uh, today. As I say, we are speaking about citizen of evidence. Already yesterday, we were discussing about the importance of citizen in exposing injustice and in exposing power asymmetries and also trying to create justice. Uh, and we were also discussing how it's possible to create social change by building up tools that allow citizens and people to share data uh, to expose abuses. And uh, today we also want uh, to document the difficulty to work with sources and also to acquire content. And uh, at the same time, we want to speak about uh, the difficulty of investigations that are related to citizens and to people that uh, risk their life to expose abuses and injustice. Uh, and also the importance of connecting with the sources and the risk related to that. Um, so, we start uh, the day with the first uh, keynote, um, and so we are really happy to welcome here Matthew Caruana Galizia and Krina Boros, so please come on stage with me. And I want to say that for us this is a very important moment because we have been already discussing about the subjects that we will touch today in our events of April, Dark Heavens, in which we also introduce the case of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And so for me it's really a honor to have you here, Matthew, and we really thank you for coming and to speak about your case, your situation and the story of Daphne. And at the same time, I want to thank Krina as a moderator, so I'm going to introduce her, and she then will introduce Matthew more in depth. Krina Boros is an award-winning investigative reporter who 
this I really like your definition, who crunches data uh, and gather forensic evidence in parallel with the field reporting. She works as a freelance and she has been published by the BBC, Reuters and Open Democracy. And she took part uh, as a freelance uh, in the investigation, the silencing of Daphne by Reuters and Forbidden Stories that took place in April 2018 with Stephen Gray and the Forbidden Stories Network. She also co-authors two journalist manual and teaches data journalism internationally. So I leave the word to you and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for joining us for a discussion that doesn't happy, happen frequently enough, namely about those issues affecting freelancers most acutely, be they journalists, media workers, investigators, researchers, and so on, hitting both personally and professionally through, the, through our work. Um, Matthew has agreed to share with us some of the problems that his mother, Daphne Caruana Galizia, murdered as a consequence of her relate, relentless pursuit for exposure of corruption in Malta, his face alone as an independent blogger. We will follow with a Q&A, and I'd like to ask the public to ready their questions for that moment. But before we start, could I have a hands up on everyone in the room who is not a journalist? Oh, quite a few. Any journalists left? Hand up. Thank you. And how many of you are actually working in some sort of form of freelance employment? Oh, almost half of us. Right. Um, we are here at an event entitled Citizens of Evidence. Uh, for most of us, evidence is the raw material for which we would go a long way to get it not for ourselves, but for a wider public and a better purpose. In our hunt, many of us suffer the consequences of not being protected by our employer, not properly, or of not being an integrated part of a team. And some of us may be hurt or hurt, or some of us even die, whether freelancers or not. And because we're in Europe, I'd like to mention Lira McKee and Vadim Komarov, who are only two of the 16 journalists killed in 2019. Whilst Lira was shot during clashes between rioters and police in the Cregan area in Northern Ireland, Vadim, an investigative reporter with the local daily in Ukraine, was found with severe head injuries indi indicative of being beaten with a heavy object according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. The other 14 journalists killed this year that we know of come from Syria, Ghana, Filipinas, Mexico, Honduras, Libya, Somalia, Chad, and Nigeria. From 1992 until now, there have been 1,460 journalists and media workers killed around the globe, again, that we know of. And the number heads north if you count those missing or jailed, or whose death motive has not yet been confirmed. To give you the numbers, since I do do data journalism, um, 62 missing journalists, 259 jailed all over the world, with the largest number of them, 38, locked away in China. It is only in the last few years that networks of journalists, such as OCCRP and Forbidden Stories, but not the only ones, have continued the work of jailed and murdered journalists. Those professions of citizens who source evidence to expose the truth feel increasingly more dangerous. And this is why this talk is so important, to shine a light on how it is for those who do it in very tough environments. We would like to first present a couple of clips, first to introduce Daphne, and the second to introduce the tragedy that followed her very punchy work in Malta. Um, these clips were done by the team at Reuters for the first release of the silencing of Daphne. Could we have the first one, please? My mother was, she was completely unlike anyone I've ever met. My mother really believed in using humor um, as a tool to undermine uh, corrupt people or 
people who abused their power, she thought the best way you could get at them was by making fun of them. And she did this extremely well, and that's what made her so dangerous to these people. I heard her walking away. I pressed resume, I remember, on the laptop to continue playing the music I was listening to. And then I heard an explosion, and I knew it was a car bomb straight away. When I arrived on the scene, it was like a war zone. There were multiple fires in different parts of the road. There were pieces of flesh on the ground, and the next few days were just... I barely remember anything. It, it was just one battle after another. There was, there was no time, just no time to kind of grieve. first and I believe we have a second clip about the tragedy. And this is and this is where the primitivity of Malta really comes out. I don't feel I'm living in a European country. I can't say I do. They have absolutely okay. no red lines. Ten days after Daphne Caruana Galizia made that statement, the investigative reporter was dead. A bomb was attached to her car. It detonated near her home, here in rural Malta. I'm Stephen Gray. In the six months since her killing, Reuters has worked in collaboration with other global media, including the New York Times, The Guardian and France too, piecing together her unsolved murder and her stories of alleged corruption. The effort is led by Forbidden Stories, a new organisation in Paris dedicated to continuing the work of silenced journalists. Daphne was as loved as she was reviled in Malta. To her admirers, she was a champion of justice, connecting government ministers to offshore tax havens. She claimed another minister visited a brothel while on a diplomatic trip, which he firmly denies. Her blog had over 500,000 views that day, more than the country's entire population. Be wrong. And I grew strong. To her critics, she was pure political attack dog. The witch of Bijnia after her hometown. Scornful, she made things personal. Her stories were often denied and sometimes unverified. She was sued by politicians, businessmen and even other journalists. Her name appears in 64 court cases since 2001. Last year, the politician she alleged visited the brothel had a court order her bank account frozen. And for over a decade, some of her main enemies had even harassed her on the street. Her dog was killed. An arsonist hit her house in 2006. Eventually in October, the bombing struck. This hill overlooks Daphne's neighbourhood. Just a day after the bombing, police began to piece together what had happened. They found this hole in the fence. And down here, a great little spot hidden from the road. They found a fresh cigarette. Right here is where a lookout kept watch. According to police evidence, the lookout must have stayed here for up to two weeks ahead of the bombing. It's a brilliant vantage point. You can see the house where Daphne Caruana Galicia lived. You can see where she parked her car. You can see the entrance from her little lane into the main road. And down there is the spot where the car exploded. Reuters sources say the bomb was constructed using some parts available at a hobby store and likely paired with the leftovers of World War II munitions. With the help of the FBI, police used the cell phone towers in the area to identify three individuals they allege were involved. One was here on the overlook. Another was at sea in a small leisure boat. CCTV said to show it departing here. All of them allegedly used throwaway burner phones to keep in contact with each other. It was the man on the boat, police say, who sent a simple text message to a device attached to the bomb, activating it. If not for one small mistake, they might have not been found out at all. The burners were pay-as-you-go phones, and when one ran out of minutes, one of the hitmen allegedly called a friend using his real, personal phone to refill it. That connection led to the arrest of three men, now in custody awaiting a court decision, Vince Muscat and the brothers George and Alfred de Gorgio. The men 
all deny playing any role in the murder. They were tracked down to this warehouse and the docks outside the capital Valletta. Some phones found discarded in the waters nearby. Alfred's DNA was found on the cigarette back at the Overlook. All three men are known to authorities as part of a small group of alleged organised crime figures, but police have not publicly discussed what would have motivated them, leaving questions over who on this island ordered the killing and why. Without further ado, I give the floor to Matthew Caruana Galizia. But the first question of this discussion, yes. Um, so when, when a team of journalists internationally got together to form a group called Forbidden Stories, you know, part of it, um, we were at a stage where OCCRP had already done an investigation, well, they've already continued the stories of a jailed member of them in Azerbaijan. This was, in a way, a different chapter and at a different level where journalists across Europe got together to form a team that would continue the stories of journalists who were murdered um, because we, had, we were fed up. We were fed up with being silenced in a way that made the silencer think, we kill a journalist, we bury the story. And Forbidden Stories members said, not really. We'll show you that we, you won't bury the story if you kill the journalist. So this is the story of Forbidden Stories, um, or at least how it began. And you played a part in that. A, a smaller part, but yes, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult to speak after that, but I thought it, it was important that we, that we show those two clips because it just explains um, two things, how, what my mother was like as a journalist, which is a bit different from how she was as a person, and uh, also how the, how the assassination was actually carried out. Um, what you see in that video, even though it was produced relatively such a long time ago, at the beginning of 2018, is to this day the extent of what we know, because ever since then, the criminal investigation has not moved forward. So a lot of the work that my brothers and my father and my mother's sisters do is pushing internationally and within Malta for the, for the investigation to move forward. Because when this happened, we, as Krina said, already had a kind, of, um, a kind of playbook for what would happen if we didn't do anything. Because of my mother's work we, and, and my own work, we were already very familiar with um, the lives and the assassinations of, of other journalists working in sort of anti-corruption investigative journalism like Anna Politkovskaya, for example. And we knew the story of what happened in each of those cases, how perhaps at the beginning a few people were arrested and nothing ever moved forward after that. Um, the family is still in the dark, the population of Russia is still in the dark about it. And the, the criminal investigations were deliberately constructed to fail. So we knew the very day that my mother was murdered that this is what would happen in Malta by default unless we did something. And this is more or less why I'm here today and why I spend a lot of my time really pushing European institutions to do something about what's happening in Malta, to put pressure on the Maltese government. It's, it's very hard because it means that we have to kind of relive this every day, but we think it's necessary um, because without it, like Rina said, the same thing will just happen over and over again. And we could, we could say perhaps, okay, 
our mother is dead now. Um, there's nothing what, that we can do about that. There's nothing we can do to bring her back to life. But for us, the question of justice is more important than anything else now. And with that, we don't just mean justice for, for my mother's murder, finding out who, who really wanted her dead, but also justice for her stories and justice for journalism in general. So this fight, I think, is something that we're doing with the help of a lot of other people who work for organizations and other journalists like Rina is, is, is for everyone, really for our societies, for other journalists who did the same work that my mother did. Um, and ultimately for myself too, because I intend to continue this kind of work. But I want to do it in an environment that's, that's safer. We can arrive at that safety, I think, not in the sort of ways in which the organizations that we work for generally instruct us to keep safe. Operational security is important, using things like encryption, um, sort of keeping a lookout, being aware of your surroundings, and so on. But the problem is that that puts the burden on us. It's a bit like telling a woman that if you don't want to get raped in the street at night, then you just have to dress conservatively. That's, that's not a solution and it unfairly puts the burden on the victim. What we really need and what my family is asking for are repercussions for the investigations that we work on and the investigations that my mother worked on. This is really the best way to guarantee our safety. And this is, I think, perhaps the, the sort of mission of Forbidden Stories, the organization that Krina worked for, to kind of raise the price of uh, raise the price of murder so that the the opportunity cost if you want to put it that way of murdering a journalist is much higher than it was before but i think we also want to want to raise the price for for corruption by the kind of senior political figures that my mother was investigating um this is, of course, extremely difficult. The, perhaps, I think the, the last year of my mother's life, which was the year following the publication of, of Panama Papers, was perhaps um, one of the most difficult ones because after we published, uh, after we published that story in April 2016, I honestly expected there to be real repercussions in Malta. The politicians whom we exposed as having engaged in or having been a part of an international network of corruption would resign or would be prosecuted. There would be some kind of fallout. But not only was there no fallout, they actually went on the offensive against us. And this is something that I never expected. But it was in that moment that I, that I realized how dangerous things were. Because not only were there absolutely no repercussions, there were no prosecutions, no criminal investigations, but the politicians, their business associates, they, they felt so safe in their corruption that they could attack us, the people who were exposing them. They were empowered with a propaganda network. The Maltese government has a budget of around 10 million euros a year, which it spends on advertising on Facebook, that it uses to push its messages, um, that they're completely clean, and what we, the journalists, are saying or exposing is a complete lie, even though we're putting hard evidence into the public domain. And at that moment, I think what I realize now in retrospect is that something had to give. My mother and I, I mean mostly my mother, were consistently day after day putting this hard evidence of corruption into the public domain and the attacks against us just continued. They ramped up. Um, Krina earlier mentioned the libel suits that were filed against my mother. In the last year of her life, 30 libel suits were filed against my mother. 19 of them 
by a single financial donor to the governing political party. So you could tell where things were going. To us, it wasn't, it was a massive shock, but it wasn't really something that came as a surprise, um, having direct experience of what was going on in Malta. The reason, another reason why we continue doing this work is probably one of the last few things that I remember my mother writing about. She said, no matter how hopeless things may seem to be in this scenario, um, we're, we're putting out all of this information, really kind of wrecking our lives, trying to get this information out there for the benefit of our readers. And we're just getting attacked for it. Um, but it's important to do it because we have to document what's happening. It's really the, the most fundamental thing that we can do as journalists, even in an environment where, there are absolutely, where there's absolutely no justice for our stories. And this is probably, and shockingly, the same thing that motivates war reporters. Even though we work in different environments, I suppose the circumstances of fear and reprisals and danger are probably very similar. What motivates a war reporter working in a situation where there's genocide or um, violent attacks against them too, like the kind of environment that Marie Colvin worked in Syria, is that no, ma no, no matter what the situation is, we have to let the world know what's actually happening. And again, this is the same thing that motivated my mother. It's the same thing that motivates my brothers and I to continue. And when we speak to journalists who perhaps might have become a bit cynical or um, people who might have become nihilistic, they tell us, I admire you for what you're doing, but I have very little hope. Or I'm sort of, they, they say, we're demotivated. Um, we don't really see the point of continuing the work we're doing because things are so bad, we just don't see it getting anywhere. But that's not true. I think what my mother's murder shows is that that sheer determination to continue really forces the people that you're investigating to resort to what one of my brothers called the nuclear option. They, they simply run out, of, run out of options and they have to resort to this, a car bomb. And, I, and that makes me really proud that my mother couldn't be stopped in any other way. I try to keep that in mind when, um, when things get really bad and they have gotten really bad over, over, the, past, over the past year. I say, look, this is, I have to remember what this is about. And this is what I tell the other people I'm working with too. We really have to remember what this is about. It's, um, it's about more than sort of the, the daily annoyances of our jobs. We, we have to remember why we entered this field in the first place. And um, I think a part of this talk is about what it's like to be a freelancer and the problems we might face. But to be honest, the kind of things that I used to complain about before um, when I worked as a freelancer really, really seem like nothing now. And I think um, I wasted so much time um, complaining about things that are insignificant or focusing on my attention on things that are insignificant. And now I feel like it's so, they, they, they were so petty. I mean, we'll talk about some of these things, but I guess uh, for someone in, in my, my position and my family member's position, uh, we, have, we have very little patience for, um, for people, who, I guess, who complain about minor annoyances uh, um, related to doing this kind of work. And uh, we, we tell people, look, you have to remember what this is about, what, what we're fighting for here. It's really, um, it's really a question of, 
of the future of our continent, I think, the future of Europe. It's not just about, um, it's not just about one politician or one criminal, it's, it's really about, about our democracy. I think also the kind of image that many people outside Malta had of the country um, in contrast to the reality that we were living and continue to live shows how far a country can decline and how, how quickly things can get very, very bad. Uh, the, the Malta that I grew up in was, was very different to this. Things really just got bad over the past couple of years. Um, it's, it can happen in any country, which is why the kind of work that journalists do is really sort of on the, on the front line of defending democracy. But again, we, we depend on, on there being repercussions for, for our work. Um, we're, we're part of a sort of ecosystem of politicians who are, who are capable of legislating for change and ensuring that there's, um, there's, there are outcomes for our investigations and of activists who are responsible for sort of creating the public pressure that makes politicians actually do something. What was missing in Malta were probably these, these two last things. My mother was doing really effective journalism, but we had, uh, we and still continue to have very little culture of activism and very little political accountability. So she was doubly isolated, I think, in that respect. She was working alone as a journalist because she was the only journalist in the country doing this kind of work. But also she was politically isolated, not even the opposition party um, sort of supported or spoke up for her investigations. And there was very little activism that was sort of rallying society um, against the people that she was investigating. These, these three things are really important. So part of our work is also to engender cultural change in Malta and get people to think differently, show them that through activism they can change things if you don't want to be a journalist, if you don't have what it takes to be a journalist, there are other things that perhaps you're good at. Um, you can go into politics or activism, there's room for all of these things. But doing this requires changing the entire culture. It's extremely difficult, it's even more difficult than I think doing actual investigative journalism because you're, you're getting, you're trying to change the thinking of an entire generation of people who have been indoctrinated by, by propaganda and perhaps a poor educational system. But I really think it's possible, um, especially learning from the examples of where it's been done in other countries or in southern Italy, for example, where NGOs have been able to, um, to rally young people against organized crime. Or in the Philippines, for example, where one organization that maybe you're familiar with called, called Rappler, which is doing a lot of investigative work into, into extrajudicial ju killings, um, also does a lot of work with communities in the Philippines. And in this way, it rallies public support itself. So it kind of mixes investigative journalism and activism. And this is, is really effective, connecting those two, those two areas. Um, I think I've, I've spoken for quite a lot about this. Like I've covered most of what we're, what we're working on. Um, it, I mean, maybe I should say that for me, this was a very difficult step to take because I had spent five years working for an organization called ICIJ, very much in the background. I'm a, I'm a software engineer by profession, but I also did a degree, a master's degree in journalism. Um, inspired by my mother, 
I wanted to go into that field and apply the the kind of lessons or uh, sort of tools of software engineering to journalism. In the beginning, everyone thought it was a really stupid idea, but now I think it's totally normal. And my my job at ICIJ was very much um, very much in the background. I did no actual reporting. Uh, most of my work was backing up or assisting the hundreds of journalists that the organization worked with all over the world and assisting them in their investigations, developing the software platforms that they needed for their investigations. So for me, making that step from that, doing that kind of work in the background where no one knew what I was doing to do this kind of very public advocacy was um, was very difficult, but in a sense not, because I felt like I had no other choice. There was no way I could go back to that life I lived before. In that very moment where I was standing in front of the car and it was on fire, I knew, I said to myself in my head, that everything, nothing is ever going to be the same again. Not just because my mother was gone, but because I knew that we were probably going to spend the rest of our lives fighting the people who did this. And obviously I wasn't going to be able to do that by just continuing as I was before. We would have to change our lives completely. Um, yes, that is extremely difficult, but we're forced to do it because no one, no one is going to do it for us. Um, it's, it's very unfortunate that things are that way. Um, my mother was lucky in a sense because she had three adult children. Um, I'm 33, my brothers are 32 and 31. We're very close, we do everything together. Um, so we can really continue this fight together. But many journalists who are murdered have, have no family, they have no children, they have no partners. Um, or the people who are close to them are, are unable um, to put up this kind of fight. B perhaps because they work in countries that are in an even worse situation. Um, or they don't have uh, human rights organizations that they're able to turn to. So I, I guess um, we're sort of empowered in that way. Uh, knowing that is, is also something that keeps me going, that, that there are people in an, in an even worse situation. We will start opening this discussion to the whole group. But I'd like to ask the first couple of questions. Um, yeah, because I hold the power. Right, so you mentioned at some point in the beginning of your speech that those criminal investigations into your mother's death were deliberately constructed to fail. Now I have to ask you, what are your reasons for, for saying that? Well, you can, you can even just look at the just looking at the data that's been collected on unsolved murders in Malta, the impunity rate is extremely high. Only three out of 10 murder investigations actually result in charges being filed by the, by the police in Malta. And an even fewer number actually result in a conviction. So even for, let's say, sort of normal murders, for want of a better word, the conviction rate is extremely low, probably the worst in Europe. For an investigation into my mother's murder, it's, it's probably going to be even worse because there are, it's, it's very obvious that there are directions that the investigating authorities simply do not want to go in in their investigation. Give me an example. It's very obvious that the, the people who are in custody now for sort of physically carrying out the murder, putting the bomb in the car and triggering it, um, were not people who, who would have wanted my mother dead for any reason other than financial gain. Um, they, they were paid to do this or, or promised to be paid in some way. Um, 
there were there were people who who masterminded the the assassination but beyond that and this is something that the united nations rapporteur has said about the murder of jamal khashoggi sometimes it just takes a very senior political leader um, to express a wish for something to be done about something who, someone who was annoying. So the Prime Minister of Malta, Joseph Muscat, might have just said, um, I wish someone would just get rid of her, or I wish, I wish um, she would just go away. And that would have been interpreted by his underlings as an instruction to do something about my mother. So the criminal investigation has to establish who the people um, who masterminded the, the, the assassination were. But we need a further inquiry that will work out who would have wanted my mother dead and perhaps what they did to sort of um, engender an atmosphere in which the murder of my mother or any other journalist is actually possible. Um, we, we need these two things. And it's clear in our conversations with the police and the prosecutor that there's a sort of certain degree of unwillingness um, to go in this direction. They're using my mother's murder as an opportunity to, to break up a very low level organized criminal network. Something I forgot to say is that before my mother was murdered using this car bomb, there were five other murders in the 13 months beforehand using this exact same method. But it was of people who were involved in drug trafficking and smuggling and things like that. So they weren't taken as seriously, even though they should have been. Obviously, if there are five car bombings within a year in Berlin, and the police don't get anywhere in, their, in those investigations, there's going to be a widespread panic. But the, the government in Malta took the position that these are just drug traffickers who are killing each other, and it's not something that, that anyone should worry about. If anything, it's good that they're sort of getting rid of each other. But what this happened was that it not only made the police lazy, they, they never developed the kind of skills that they needed to, uh, to catch the people who were doing this. It was only thanks to the help of the FBI that the police in Malta were able to catch the, um, to catch the people who put the bomb in the car using phone records, as, as that clip showed. And also, it made us, um, it made us sort of complacent as a, as a society. We, we got used to violence, and we got used to corruption, and we got used to a lack of accountability. And at the same time, the, the sort of material executors were allowed to, to develop their skills. They were allowed to become highly professional car bombers. If you decide you want to become a baker, the, the more you do it, the more you bake these cakes, the better you're going to become at it. These people became very good at, at car bombing because they just did it many, many times. Um, and they also sort of tested the limits of the police in Malta. Um, one of our suspicions is that they had started planning a long time before and used these, these other car bombings as a sort of practice run for eventually um, doing the one that they would use to murder my mother. Uh, the police are, are not very keen to sort of go in this direction. And of course, no charges have been filed against anyone for the, for the previous five, five car bombings. I believe he was one of the executioners on the day uh, it happened that he, I think he made a call to his girlfriend, was it? He sent a message to his wife saying, um, I've caught two big fish, let's open a bottle of wine. Let's open a bottle of wine. Um, I understand that the FBI investigators are not allowed to fully testify in court in Malta, is that correct? No, they did, they did testify in court. Eventually? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult for that to happen, but they did. Uh, we just have a really badly run justice system, 
and it's very difficult for things to move forward. Going back very quickly to one of the things that I feel all of us could be going through at some stage, I remember um, that at some point we were talking and um, I remember somebody saying from the, from the group there's been a number of intimidations and threats that Daphne received for many years and I was wondering if you could list a few uh, that have stuck with you and how you saw her dealing with them or how you felt whilst they were happening. I mean, I think probably the turning point was when I was about nine years old and my, my mom had picked us up from school um, because back then she was working as a freelancer, so she sort of had the freedom to, uh, to determine her own hours and sometimes she would pick us up from school. And when we got home, we, we had a collie, sort of like Lassie, but black. And I just remember seeing the, the collie sort of lying down in front of the, the door to the house. And at the time as a kid, I had never seen sort of blood really. I mean, I had seen blood, but not like so much blood. So when I saw it, I didn't really know what it was. And uh, I said, ah, maybe the dog got bitten by a snake because there, there are a lot of snakes around where we live. And my mother said, yes, yes, maybe that's what happened. But when I sort of look back and analyze this memory, it was very obvious that the dog's throat had been slit and it just had been dumped in front of the doorstep. And this was a sort of way of warning, uh, warning my mother that if she continued, things would, would escalate. And in fact, they did. After that, someone set the front door of the house on fire. Then we, we got more dogs after that. One of them was shot, another was poisoned. Um, then in 2006, my mother was writing a lot about um, uh, neo-Nazis who wanted to sort of literally kill um, black refugees who were coming to Malta. And they, they, set, they set our house on fire. And because nothing ever happened, there were never any proper investigations, no charges were filed. What for do you mean nothing ever nothing, happened? Nothing, literally nothing. I mean the police never Sorry, investigated. No, nothing. And the thing is for me, sort of I grew up thinking that this was normal. If you're a journalist, this is what your life is like. Um, you sort of have to live with this. And I, I got accustomed to the fact that nothing would happen. Um, that it's sort of, uh, it's, it's just what you have to live with. But isn't there a sense of anxiety in the house, if within the family when this happens, isn't there your father saying maybe you should change professions? I'm just thinking from the mindset of other partners, of other No, uh, no it was never like that. My right. father never told my mother, uh, you should do something else. I mean, we knew who my mother was as a person, right. and also we knew that and I think this is an important lesson for everyone. The thing about bullies is that they don't respond to weakness. Right. If, you, if you're not resilient, if you sort of back down, they're just going to get more, they're going to become more emboldened. And this is really important. You have to fight back. Otherwise, they're just going to get more and more, more and more violent. Um, and also other people who perhaps try and step up are also going to become victims. It's just really important to fight back. It's the only language that they understand. Right. Let's open the discussion in the room. If you have any question, please put your hand up and just briefly state your name, what you do, and your question. Yes, the gentleman at the back. Do we have a microphone at the back, or how does it work? Thank you. Um, I'm Tony from Belgium, and uh, I'll introduce myself as an activist. I've been working on uh, um, campaigns against Volta Funds. Uh, uh, it was a few years ago with a little organization called uh, CADTM, as well as a coalition of Belgian NGOs. Against what? Sorry, I didn't... Volta Funds. Uh, idiot, not to name it. And... Uh, um, the other uh, subsidiaries of Iliot um, 
it's a big vulture fund investing in uh, high yield debt of poor countries. So I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, the fact, I mean, your, your description of what happened to uh, your uh, uh, mother, Daphne, because um, you're pointing out the fact that she had, she was alone and had no political accountability. Um, to her memory, I would say that she wanted to remain independent, right? You're saying that she had no culture, she had no culture of activism, but that's also because she wanted to stay objective, right? To remain objective. So how to define accountability as a transmitter of information when you are part of a political organization or a political movement or something that is close to a political movement as an activist movement? Uh, so what I mean by political, I mean in the very broader sense, not necessarily a party or running for the elections. Um, right, I suppose we need to redefine what it is to have accountability in this, uh, in this regard. So well, uh, you, you, you gave a few examples of that and maybe you could elaborate on what, how you view it personally in, ter in terms of relationship with uh, political organizations who might be able to fight back, as you mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you. One, one of the things that um, I can do now because I've, I've sort of abandoned um, my previous career is that we can, we can use the law, we can litigate for accountability. In Europe, things are a bit different because even though things might seem very bad now or, or that they're getting worse, we're lucky because um, in, in the early 90s or, or perhaps the, the 70s or 80s, we passed through a kind of period where, where suddenly our governments discovered human rights. And they created these, these organizations like the Council of Europe and got the different, um, the different countries of Europe to sign up to principles that basically became law in, in our different countries. The, um, the European Court of Human Rights is, is an organization that is ultimately the supreme court of all, our, all of our different countries. So something that my family is doing now is using this legislation, um, not, just, not just human rights legislation, but also anti-money laundering directives, for example, that come from the European Union to force accountability. This is something that's impossible to do as a journalist for a lack of resources, but also because it goes, it goes beyond what you're supposed to be doing as a journalist. Your, your job is, is documentation and sort of forcing the exposure of, of information and of evidence of bringing it into the public domain. Litigation is generally something that is reserved for, for activists. So organizations that do this kind of work are really important. Um, litigating for accountability. Your government isn't respecting, the, isn't respecting the rights of refugees or isn't prosecuting a politician for whom there is a lot of evidence um, that they've engaged, engaged in corruption, then we can litigate for action to be taken. We can force our, our country's prosecutors or our country's judicial system to conduct investigations or we can force respect for human rights. This is, this is really important. Uh, there are many organizations that do it, some big, some small. Um, Global Witness, which is a kind of anti-corruption organization, does this really often. They, they look for evidence where European companies have been involved in corrupt deals especially in poorer countries, in West Africa, for example. And they, they litigate against those companies, they file lawsuits against them to force accountability. 
this is one of the ways in which there can be real repercussions for the work of investigative journalists. Yes, the lady in front here in the middle. Uh, hi, my name is Sia and I am a, an economist and an analyst um, by vocation currently and I was made aware and uh, took quite a high interest in your mother's story quite a few years ago, namely because I come from Bulgaria originally, which um, I see as suffering some of the, some very similar patterns as to what happens in Malta, namely this kind of um, extremely corrupt bordering on state capture situation in a small community. Um, and so when your family began fighting for this um, at the kind of European level and started appealing to yeah, the European Court of, for Human Rights and um, all of that, I began to wonder whether this is an effective tool in which one can um, pursue in order to um, yeah, force something to happen within the country of origin. So my question to you would be, um, do you see the response of the EU and institutions within the EU as adequate, and do you see it as a kind of like viable option for um, yeah, pushing these kind of stories further? It's not adequate, but the, the thing is, we, we can either sort of complain about it all the time, or we can actually work to move these organizations forward. Um, th the reason that we have these things in the first place, like, um, the European Court of Human Rights or the European Parliament, that, that's because people have fought very hard for them to become a reality. And if we want to move things beyond that, then we have to fight equally hard to develop them. Um, they, they never happen on their, on their own. They happen because people have made sacrifices, they fought for them to be developed. So the the kind of advocacy that we're doing within European institutions um, is important because we want to use the tools that currently exist. For example, at the beginning of 2018, just a few months after the murder, my brothers and I went to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and we advocated for a special rapporteur to be appointed to investigate the circumstances of my mother's murder. This is only the third time in the entire 40-year history of the institution that this had been done. And it's not something that has teeth. The, the rapporteur can't really sort of, they, they can't prosecute, they can't take any, any sort of judicial action. But we have to test the limits of the tools that are available in order to then develop them further we have to really sort of push the boundaries of what's possible so that we can then go beyond them. Um, this is important at a national level, but also at an international level by discovering what's not possible and what's possible at a European level. We can then go to politicians and say, look, we're trying to do this. We're trying to force accountability within our member state. It's not currently possible with the political tools that are available. We need this, this and that in order to move forward. And then we begin the process of advocating within the legislative bodies for those changes to actually happen. It's a very, very long process. Um, and it's very hard. You need to sort of keep going and really not lose, not lose patience. It's very, very difficult. Um, Activists who've lobbied for uh, for gay rights or for people or for sort of legislation against single-use plastics and anything like that, they know what I'm talking about because they know how long these things can take. Um, the the process of sort of strengthening our institutions against corruption is is really similar. Um, even within Bulgaria and within Malta, it is possible. We, we can win this fight against corruption. We just have to be very stubborn and, and not give up. But we can get there. So don't lose hope, don't lose your nerve. No. I think, yeah, the gentleman on the side, at the back. All the questions come from my right and the sides. Nothing at the left. 
So um, the Parliamentarian Assembly of the Council of Europe, they gave a deadline to the government until the 26th of September to open an inquiry on the case. And so yesterday or two days ago, the government uh, so confirmed that there will be an inquiry. But could you explain, uh, I think you are not uh, satisfied uh, because it will not be an independent uh, inquiry, but a public inquiry. Could you explain what the demand of the assembly was? and? what kind of um, inquiry, inquiry there will be? The point of the public inquiry is to investigate how my mother's murder was possible, which is what we were talking about earlier. The, the police can only go as far in any country as criminal culpability. But of course, in a, in a situation like this, um, there is a kind of political culpability too. There are politicians who created an atmosphere in which the, journal, the murder of a journalist is possible by, by turning her into a hate figure and conducting a campaign, a propaganda campaign against her. The, the, the point of the public inquiry is to look, investigate this and also whether the authorities knew that there was, a, there was a plot to murder my mother and did nothing about it. And also whether they ought to have known because it was very obvious that my mother was going to be murdered, but they didn't because the institutions weren't working properly. It's to sort of figure out what lessons can be learned and make our country better at preventing this. It's really about that. Um, the reason we're not, we, we don't think that the way the government has proposed the inquiry would run is right is because it's not independent. It's not enough for there to be a public inquiry, it has to be independent and impartial. Again, this is not something that we're, we're sort of, we're saying it's the law. Um, the law says that investigations done by judicial authorities have to be independent and impartial. They can't be done by a partisan figure or by someone who's working for a political party. They have to be done by independent and impartial people. So who is running it now? Sorry? So who is running it now that makes it not independent? Last night, the Prime Minister said that the three people on the Board of Inquiry will be a former judge. Um, that's a problem because this person is involved in the, in the criminal trial against the three accused and also a lawyer who actually defends in court one of the people whom my mother was investigating and another person who is a political appointee um, by the Prime Minister. So he's a sort of acquaintance of the Prime Minister whom the Prime Minister appointed um, to another government body, meaning he's, he's completely financially dependent on the Prime Minister. Of course, these people are structurally not independent. Therefore, they cannot conduct an ind independent investigation. And can, can the family raise any issues about that? Yes, we can. Um, but we have a very short period. The government has given about a week for us to formally raise our objections. Because the way the law is written, um, once the Board of Inquiry has been constituted, uh, members of the board can only be removed by a two-thirds vote in Parliament, which is, of course, extremely difficult to achieve because the Parliament is controlled by the governing party. Right. Further questions in the room? Yes? Here in front. Yes, I wanted to ask you something uh, that brings the discourse on another perspective because here at the Disruption Lab we have been invited the whistleblowers also in the past and also when we were doing uh, the events about the Panama Papers we were discussing about the act of whistleblowing. Do you think that in the case of your mother there could be some measure about whistleblowing protection that could be applied because in a sense I think uh, your mom was a whistleblower. You think that from that kind of perspective there could be something that could be uh, brought into this case and also um, 
help us discussing more about the source protection? I mean, of course, these things help, but a lot of them are sort of a, a deal with the devil. Because, like we were saying earlier, the real protection for, for journalists and activists comes from the state actually doing something to, to deliver justice. If there is no justice for the stories, the evidence that journalists and activists are bringing to light, then they are always inherently going to be at risk. And no sort of whistleblower protection or anything like that is going to protect their lives or guarantee their safety. Um, we can use the example of Italy where a actually a huge number of the country's journalists are under 24-hour police protection. I understand why, why that is necessary, but it, it, isn't the, it isn't the ideal scenario because journalists who are under 24-hour police protection are simply not free to do their job. It's impossible for you to do your job as a journalist if you always have police officers following you. Yes, your personal safety is important, but the state knows what needs to be done to guarantee the safety of that journalist. It needs to put the people that we're investigating in jail and then we'll be safe. I mean, for put it, giving us police protection or any kind of sort of special status or anything like that is just a sort of stopgap solution. We need, we need there to be real justice. And then you have whistleblowers who do not trust the policeman and would not approach a journalist who is protected by the police. I mean, this is a sort of... Because at the same time, with, with, big and with big investigations like the Panama Papers, unless we find a way of bridging the gap between judicial authorities and the journalism, nothing will happen. Um, things only started to really move forward with the Panama Papers when the German government got a copy of the leak. And it was only because of this that justice started to happen. Yes, great, we, got the we, we did the investigation, we got the information out, um, we published a lot of brilliant stories, but these people have to go to jail. And that can only happen if the state authorities get their hands on the evidence. So that sort of gap has to be bridged. And I think even in situations where the whistleblowers do not fully trust the police, you sort of have to, have to be brave and find a way of working around that fear, or perhaps go to ju the judicial authorities of another country and work with those, maybe you trust them more. Um, Bridging that gap is, is really necessary, otherwise nothing is going to happen. Journalists cannot prosecute, as much as we'd love to. We cannot, we cannot send people to prison. And we Only shouldn't. the state can do that. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't, no. I mean, this is how a democracy works. Exactly. Everyone has a different job, and that's how it should be. Exactly. Picking up on the idea of protection and of whistleblowers and of working with journalists, I can't help feeling because originally I'm from Romania. I do live and work in London, but originally I come from southern eastern Europe, right? And when you work in big networks that put out very um, revealing leaks and you show corruption about people in your own country, I can't help feeling that journalists in central, eastern, southern part of Europe are a bit closer to the food chain than you have journalists in western in the Western world, maybe it's just a biased perception. But I wonder what do you think about that? And well, it's, it's, you, you might have the local mafia gangs or politicians in some way retaliating against you personally, or you feel unsafe quicker, you do have your dog's throat slit, etc., or different ways of warning you. Whereas in the West, I've never felt when I was doing anything that I was in danger. And I was wondering whether in your experience working for ICIJ or maybe with other groups as well, whether you've, you've encountered cases of journalists from other parts of so non-West, non-North world, feeling a bit closer. Yes, I mean, you. that it goes without saying. It's, um, 
it's the, the sort of distance between journalists who work in the kind of environment that journalists in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe work in, and perhaps even in Cyprus and Malta, um, and journalists in London or Paris or New York, it's, it's just, it's a really massive distance between them. And perhaps the answer is no, but is, is there any way in which these big network organizations, anything they could do extra to protect these more vulnerable journalists, do you think? Yes, they can, um, they can work with them. This is why Forbidden Stories was so important, because it sort of brought, um, brought people from a very comfortable uh, environment in which to do journalism where the only thing you have to worry about is um, your pension, I guess, and whether you're going to get it or not. And, um, and journalists who work in, in an environment where they worry about their lives every day. Um, and I think we can learn from both. Um, the disappointment comes from, I think, larger organizations that have a lot of money. Um, like perhaps the BBC, Bloomberg, um, sort of big, big, really, really big organizations that do very little to sort of back this kind of work. Sometimes they can feel a little bloodless, like they just think of the death of a journalist as, as being something unavoidable. Of course, it, it isn't that way. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. <laughs> in the meantime, I just wanted to check in the room if anyone else would like to. I mean, one other thing I guess I could say is that big networks of journalists like ICIJ have become a bit better at um, speaking up for their members. Uh, I think this is a change that has happened over the past few years uh, because they've just sort of had enough um, it's become really intolerable. So do they offer legal protection in case of lawsuit or compensation in case no, of harm? No, they don't. No. 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 It's entirely on your shoulders as, as the individual journalist. Right. One example, I mean, because Malta's, Malta's so messed up, my family actually inherited all of the ongoing lawsuits that had been filed against my mother. So we inherited around 46, I think, and now we're down to 29. Um, Lucky you. <laughs> and we, the only support that we got for fighting these came from a Dutch NGO called Free Press Unlimited. They get funding from the, from the Dutch government to, to support investigative journalists. And they supported us with a grant that allows us to pay lawyers to work on the defense of these cases. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a lot, it's a lot of work. I mean, my mother had, had about four lawyers working full time. And most of them were working for free, obviously, because my mother couldn't afford to pay them all. But there's so much work that they simply can't work for free full time. They, they need to make a living. So, Thankfully, this organization sort of helped us with that because we really didn't know how we were going to continue. Was there any scenario in which your mother could have chosen or to publish or was possible to publish everything she wanted to with the mainstream media outlet? One example that I remember really well because um, when we were children, my mother would pick us up from school sometimes or um, whatever, we'd be in her car and she'd, she'd go and drop off. At the time, um, she didn't have email, so she would actually type up her, her articles, print them and sort of hand deliver them to the newspaper. And one time that I remember really well, I was maybe about 10 years old, was when she said, okay, wait a minute, I'm coming back. And she sort of parked the car outside the newspaper building, went inside. <laughs> And then came out uh, about 15 minutes late, and she was very angry um, because the newspaper didn't want to publish her article. It was about a conflict of interest that one of the one of the people on the board of trustees of the newspaper had 
um, with uh, his daughter was representing a drug trafficker that my mother was investigating and anyway it was a long story but she got in the car and immediately drove to another newspaper and got it published there so that was really the only time that I remember this happening but for me, it was a sort of formative experience. It taught me how to react in this kind of situation. So when I was in a similar situation, when I was working at a newspaper in Costa Rica, uh, and the, the editors wanted to censor one of our projects, for me, it was very obvious what we had to do. But for my colleagues, it was a sort of very, they spent a long time to, thinking about it. But for me, it was immediately obvious. We had to hand in our resignations. And that's what we ended up doing. But it was only because I had this experience, I guess, from my mother, and I sort of went through it when I was very young. Any more questions from the room that we may take? I have one I more. Mean, sorry, one thing to say yeah. related to the question about activism from the back. These things might seem very difficult from the outside. Um, I mean, they might seem technically difficult, but they're actually not. The, the only thing you need is sort of the ability to think strategically and just a lot of energy, and you need to be very stubborn. Um, my brothers and I had no experience of working with international institutions. We had never even, I had never even been to the Council of Europe. But um, we, we were able to pull it off, just sort of, I guess, with stubbornness. And even, I use the example of litigating. Uh, again, this is not something that's easy to do, but you don't need to be a lawyer. You just need the ability to work with a lawyer who has experience um, doing these kinds of cases. And there are many who are, who are willing to do that. So, I would really encourage everyone to use the sort of legal tools and the political tools that there are available to us. And since there are very few journalists in the room, <laughs> I can actually encourage you to do that. You can use the law, you can use the courts, you can use the political, political institutions, you can use members of the European Parliament. It's really important to sort of engage them to do this kind of stuff, because if you don't, they're going to do other things that are perhaps less important. Since we have time for one last question, since nobody else in the room seems to put their hand up, I'd just like to ask you, I thought it, it was both funny and scary, um, your experience as a freelancer in Paris, um, what a freelancer contract would not necessarily help you, and I was wondering if you could tell the public as well how problematic a freelancer contract could be in, in a Western developed rich country. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> doing the kind of work we were doing before was, was very easy when we were in our 20s and our sort of needs were, were low, I guess. Um, living in a 30 square meter apartment in Paris um, with a toilet that isn't functioning or whatever is like okay when you're 27 but as you get older your sort of needs and aspirations start to change um, but unfortunately the organization that you work for is less willing to change or is less willing to understand your aspirations <laughs> and I think this, is, this, this was one of the things that made our work really difficult um, that we were on these kinds of contracts that were that were very poorly paid. Um, they were freelance contracts, even though we were working full time for the same organization with all of the sort of obligations of an employee, but on a freelance contract. So uh, buying a house, getting a loan or whatever, things like that are out of the question. Um, but unfortunately, the number of organizations that is that are willing to sort of put you on full-time contracts to do this kind of work is very low. So you really have to be willing to pay this price. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. It's just that's the reality. So thank you very much, Matthew. I, I know when... I we mean, if, if we get more financial support, then 
if the organizations we work for get for more financial support, I guess things will change. Um, but for now, this is sort of the way they are. Um, my mother was in a different position because she was a very multifaceted person and she did everything with a lot of passion and she had like an unlimited amount of energy. So she, she had, a, had a publishing company which published a magazine about absolutely nothing to do with what she was working on. It was about food, architecture and, and design. And most of her income came from this magazine. But she was so good at her job that she only had to spend four days maybe every month. It was enough to produce this magazine. And then she could spend the rest of the days in the month doing this anti-corruption investigative journalism. <laughs> so it was a bit like these sort of series that I used to watch when I was a kid um, about like a chef who <laughs> works as a chef at night and then during the day works as a private investigator. It was a bit <laughs> like that. She was kind of like that. Um, food and corruption. Yes, food and corruption. <laughs> but I think she also thought that you needed beauty to go with everything else, that societies that are fair, that are democratic, are, are sort of beautiful societies in all senses. And societies that are very corrupt are, are ugly. And part of the work that we do is, is, I mean, making our societies more beautiful. And she felt strongly that her magazine was about that, about bringing beauty into people's lives and showing people the sort of beautiful things that they were out there. It was a way of saying, this is why we do the other stuff, because of this. Um, because we want to live in a world that's like this. So um, I met Matthew in London at some time after we published uh, The Silencing of Daphne, and he was giving a speech at the Center for Investigative Journalism about his mother and her work. And I ungraciously asked him whether speaking about her gets easier with each speech, and he said that on the contrary, it doesn't, it's the other way. So let's thank him again for his, for his time and courage very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. much really thank you I also wanted to thank you for this and uh, uh, speaking about creating a beautiful society I also wanted to say that uh, there is the possibility to sign uh, a petition from the, the, for transparency that is also promoted by Transparency International that have been collaborating with us also in creating this uh, panel and so I'd advise you to sign these uh, papers at the entrance and thank you very much again um, and uh, we will meet in 15 minutes for the next panel in which we will go into the tools for enabling uh, uh, citizens to you know discuss about uh, power abuses uh, and also a source uh, and so on so come back uh, later and then we'll discuss about uh, also how to make that accessible and more open for people for, abu for exposing abuses. Thank you. <laughs>